Have you ever put a patient on capnometry, only to remember that you don't remember what the numbers mean? <laughs> Neither have I, but here at Rockwall County EMS, we put together a little video for those that have, or, you know, for a friend. Now, capnometry is a topic we could literally spend all day talking about, and that's just not this video. This is a short, simple video over high and low capno numbers and how that correlates to some of the more common respiratory calls we might see in EMS. Before we get started, though, there's a few things to talk about to clarify so you don't look like an idiot when you drop these people off at the hospital. Number one, capnometry versus capnography. They're two different, but of course related things. The numerical value displayed on your monitor is capnometry. Think metry, metric, measuring numbers. The graphical waveform is capnography. That one's a little more straightforward. It's the squiggly line that runs across the bottom of your monitor screen, indicating that your patient is still breathing. Well, hopefully still breathing. If they're not, you should probably do something about that. Number two, the sampling device itself. There's quite a bit of confusion, especially when uh, it comes to this nasal cannula version of CO2 sampling, as to where the air is coming out of and going into this device. Everything you see dyed in blue is for CO2 sampling. Air is drawn out of the patient and sent back to the monitor for a sampling of CO2 content. Contrary to popular belief, neither one of the little nose, nair, plug, prong things, or the mouth dish, I believe that's the technical term for all of that, uh, neither one of those areas is for oxygen delivery. In fact, everything you see in green is actually where the oxygen is being delivered from. If you're familiar with this device, it sits on the patient's upper lip, and it would really just hyperoxygenate the airspace in front of the patient's nose and mouth, and really rely on them to inhale to draw some of that air in. It doesn't work like a regular nasal cannula. Because of that reason, you can't use this device for passive pre-oxygenation. That's a method by which you would use a nasal cannula, crank that thing up to 15, and use a hyperoxygenated jet stream of air going up the patient's nose, back around the oropharynx, and into the trachea, even during times of apnea, say for instance while you're visualizing the patient's airway prior to RSI. If you did that with this device, cranked it up to 15 liters per minute on the oxygen, you'd really just kind of hyperoxygenate that space in front of their face, and it would do them no good. It might do you a bit of good while you're down there visualizing the airway, but it's not going to work in the traditional sense. Keep that in mind. Number three, kind of unrelated, but also not. It's a personal pet peeve of mine. It's SpO2 sats, not stats. Think oxygen saturation, not baseball statistics. Now it's important to consider the anatomy of physiology concepts behind the diagnostic tool that is capnography. Let's talk about the pH buffering system. Back in chemistry you learned that after... Let's not. We'll leave the buffering system for another video maybe and instead for now we'll try a simple analogy. Think of the lungs as a source of raw material and a site for removal of waste. The cells, quite fittingly, as factories that use that raw material to keep the body going which is a process that creates a waste byproduct. And finally, think of the blood, vessels, and hemoglobin specifically as a method for shipping all of this to and from the cells and lungs. The lungs take in oxygen, blood ships that oxygen to the cells, where it's then dropped off to be used, and as it's used, carbon dioxide waste is created. Well, kinda. This, of course, is an oversimplified version of the story, but the gist of it's the same. So then that CO2 is taken back up to the lungs, where it's exhaled, and Inhalation brings in new oxygen and the cycle starts all over again. Let's have a look at just the lungs themselves. It's important to know that this doesn't happen one step at a time. It's kind of a synchronized and continuous process with many actions happening simultaneously. Air is going in and out of the lungs and as that's happening, blood is flowing nonstop uh, around the lungs through the capillary beds that surround each alveoli. And these hemoglobin trucks are coming in one right after another. Let's remove oxygen from the equation, have a look at just the CO2, because for our lesson, that's what we're concerned with. Now, this is our baseline rate. I don't know what number it is, let's call it 12 to 16. And to get a better idea of what's happening here, let's count how many little CO2 molecules come out of the lungs with each exhalation cycle. 16. Keep in mind that this is just an arbitrary number I chose as a baseline. It's not the actual number we're going to see on a monitor in real life, 
Uh, we'll talk about that later. But for now, just remember our training baseline of 16 with our normal ventilatory rate. Now, tachypnea, fast breathing rate. Let's increase the ventilatory rate and see what happens. 8. So by the end of exhalation, we got up to 8. Whereas before, with a slower rate, we had more time to collect CO2 molecules in the lungs before they were exhaled. Now we only get a couple truckloads in before the CO2 gets kicked out. So 8 was our total for tachypnea. Alright, bradypnea, slow breathing. Because of the slower rate of breathing, we've got plenty of time to collect CO2 before it gets shipped out. And you can see here that before inhalation even happens, we've got quite a bit of CO2 molecules stacked up in the lungs and ready to be exhaled. At the end of exhalation, we've gotten up to 32. Because of that slower rate, more of it collected, more of it got measured as it came out. Now let's have a look at what actually happens on the monitor. We use an inline sampler to collect that CO2 as it's exhaled. The heart monitor measures it or, or numbers it just like we did before and gives us that reading. Note a normal heart rate here of 76, a ventilatory rate of 14 within our normal, normal range, and then technically our normal range for capnometry is 35 to 45. Remember that, 35 to 45. With a rapid rate, remember the molecules coming in have little time to collect before exhalation, so our number should be lower than baseline. Of course, since I made this presentation, surprise it is, with a decipnic rate of 28, we have a low capno reading of 25. Hyperventilation causes hypocarbia, which causes an electrolyte shift in the body and could manifest as carpal pedal spasms. Conversely, a low ventilatory rate would give you a high capno number because of all that time uh, the blood has to drop loads of CO2 off in the lungs before it all gets exhaled. Now our new rate, our bradypnic rate of 6, will give us a high capno reading of 55. Uh, bradypnea causes hypercarbia. Now wait a minute, some of you might, as, uh, might have noticed a problem here. Maybe where the real world numbers don't line up to what we're talking about. Maybe some of you have had an agonal patient or a patient with agonal respirations, threw them on the capno line and got low numbers on the monitor, maybe even down below 10. Let's have a look at the big picture again. The incongruence here is likely a result of several factors. First, perhaps your patient isn't moving air well enough to bring the CO2 molecules from the lungs up to the sample line at the face. Second, and arguably the more causative factor most responsible for the number mix-up is cardiac output. For those individuals we find in agonal respirations, uh, it's likely that they too also have uh, either in insufficient cardiac output or they're entirely pulseless. Capno measurements not only give you a direct look at what's happening in the lungs, but also an indirect look at cardiac output and what's happening down the line in cell systems. So that's alveolar respiration, cardiac output and performance, and then cellular respiration or metabolism. That's where this whole thing starts to get pretty complicated, actually, but for now, we'll settle for a sneak peek at what might be, I don't know, a future topic for a future video. So with our patient with agonal ventilations, again, that's probably a result of low cardiac output, the incongruent numbers we find on our monitor. So as this patient takes these piddly little breaths that mean mostly nothing, the cells are still producing their waste product of uh, CO2 that starts to back up and collect. And even as we might bag this patient, we're still not getting better numbers on our capno reading. But then we do the best CPR ever, slow-mo high-five each other, because now we get a spike in capno readings. That means we've probably done enough recessive efforts to restore the shipping lines, get a spike in ROSC, which would be a very good sign in this case, uh, and that would lead to... Uh, actually an improved prognosis for your patient, a be better outcome, a better likelihood that they're going to turn out, uh, uh, in one of the more rare cases, a positive uh, post-CPR outcome. In any case, that was a little snippet, uh, a very simplified overview of a very complex issue. Uh, we'll leave that for another time. For now, this has been Russ again with Rockwell County EMS, and as always, we'd like to give a quick shout out to our video sponsor, Blood and Stuff Transit Company, or CO2 Transport is a breath of fresh air.